First of all, let me say what a great honor it is to be here. Uh, I've known Benedetto now, first of all, from his work, but then personally, uh, and to be asked to come and, and speak here uh, is truly an honor. Uh, and to join a group that uh, spent a lot of time and, and invested a, a lot of professional interest in the subject of asbestos uh, makes this a little bit like, uh, as they say, taking colds to Newcastle. But I do hope to share some uh, maybe different perspective. Uh, as many of you are uh, trained uh, as epidemiologists and published in that way, or having worked in that field. That's not my forte. As you heard, I'm a, a physician who's trained in internal uh, medicine and occupational medicine. Uh, my doctoral degree looked at the effects of asbestos on organ cultures. Uh, I did cell culture, organ culture, animal work. I'm not going to speak about that today. That was done with the idea of trying to understand the mechanism by which asbestos caused cancer. And to this day, no matter how many people have looked at that, we, we don't necessarily know that. So it's, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here and to have my dear friend Barry Castleman here. Barry uh, shared some thoughts with me, so I need to give him credit for some additional thoughts and slide that I added to this talk um, at the end. So, I'll get to this whole issue of science for sale uh, towards the end of the talk, but uh, uh, I'm sure that's a thought that is not uh, unknown to uh, many of you. But before we get there, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit of, of what I know about asbestos, uh, take a, a, a rather broad view uh, of how it's been used around the world and what's uh, uh, developed uh, historically uh, about this material. So, there's a long history of the use of asbestos and, uh, and its hazards. I'm not going to go through the ancient Romans knowing about the hazards of asbestos. Asbestos has been used uh, uh, for millennia uh, by, by different cultures, uh, and it was at least by some known to be hazardous. Again, the term asbestos uh, comes from a Greek word, which means unquenchable. Uh, Benedetto uh, shared with me a thought. He was wondering if uh, the word asbestos ever showed up in the uh, ancient texts of the, uh, the Bible and other religious writings. It actually shows up three times in the New Testament. The Greek word uh, asbestos, meaning in that setting, unquenchable, if it was about the fire. Uh, that was uh, not to go out uh, at the temple uh, because uh, if you use an asbestos wick and keep the oil from the, from the lamps, uh, the fire would never go out. Asbestos comes in two varieties. There's five amphiboles uh, that only made up a very small percentage of uh, use around the world. Uh, the only two that are of major economic importance were uh, Priscillite and Amosite, but 90, 95% of all the world's asbestos was white asbestos or the serpentine form. Um, and in, in that issue lies some of the uh, issues we're going to discuss later about which form of asbestos causes disease. The simple answer is they all do, but not everybody wants you to believe that. This is a slide. Uh, here we have, does that show up? Yeah, it does. It's a little hard to see, but here's a, an asbestos body. An asbestos body is a fiber of asbestos, usually on an amphibole, uh, that is covered by an iron and protein matrix. We can do special iron stains for it to pick it up. And this is from an autopsy done in the year 1899. There was a gentleman of about 35, 36, and Dr. Montague Murray was his physician, and when he died, he did his autopsy. But before he died, uh, Montague Murray had uh, gotten a history, and the gentleman said that he and nine mates, 10 young men, 
less than 10 years earlier, had started working at an asbestos factory in the East End of London, a textile factory that would uh, figure in the history of asbestos again a bit later. And uh, Montague Murray said that he was the 10th and last to die. They had all died of respiratory disease. Uh, uh, and he was the 10th and last. So the autopsy was done when the man died in uh, 1899. This had been called at the time a curious body. Nobody quite knew what it was. Um, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But right now, the world production of asbestos, this figure is a little old. It's, it's not quite 2 million tons, but it's still a huge amount of asbestos for something that's been banned in over 70 countries. Half of the world's asbestos comes from Russia. Other major sources are mines in Kazakhstan, China, there's mines in other countries as well. And again, this is figures from about 10 years ago where it was used uh, between India and China. Those two countries alone used half the world's asbestos. Brazil has now banned it, but you see uh, where else it is uh, used. There are other countries uh, that don't make the list because it's uh, not a major country with use, but there are still countries that make use of asbestos. <coughs> the World Health Organization estimates about 250,000 asbestos related deaths yearly in America. We have about 40,000 deaths a year. Uh, 70 countries or so have totally banned use of asbestos. Uh, I hate to always have to say this, but not in America. The United States has not been this past as one of the things that people like Barry and I and many others uh, working with NGOs and trying to educate the congressional people, uh, trying to get a ban put in place. Um, if we leave it to uh, organizations like the EPA, uh, that is fought in court. Uh, rather successfully by industry. We might have time to discuss that later. Uh, there was a ban put in place, for example, in 1989. Uh, industry took it to court uh, and beat the ban, and that's why it's still legal. A very simple question is, does stopping the use of uh, asbestos stop uh, disease? And we know the answer to that now. It, Definitely is yes. The Swedes stopped using asbestos about 30 years ago. Interestingly, the first country to ban it was Iceland, but the Swedes soon thereafter. And if you look at their rates of mesothelioma, they are markedly decreased compared to uh, what they were. Um, and that's uh, true in many of the countries where the bans have been in place. The problem, of course, is the very, very long latency. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, and so even if we stopped in America today, we'd have disease for the next 50 years. Data collection in some parts of the world is poor. Uh, again, the epidemiologists here know this as a basic tenet. The absence of data does not mean the absence of disease. And so in countries uh, like India, where I've done work for 20 years, the government agency that was uh, tasked with recording uh, mesothelioma cases had never recorded a single mesothelioma, but I learned that in one cancer hospital alone in uh, Mumbai, former Bombay, in one year alone they took care of 32 mesothelioma cases, but none had ever been report recorded by the government agency. There are indeed some legitimate questions about uh, science, uh, various fiber toxicity. Um, the, the different fibers uh, carry a different rate of, um, of disease. We know this from many culture systems and animals. Uh, we'll talk about some of that. Uh, the real question is, is there a difference in terms of mesothelioma? The epidemiological data suggests that, but other data does not. So I think it's still a bit open. Fiber size, uh, Stanton, so-called Stanton hypothesis. He was a pathologist at the National Cancer Institute, and he uh, showed that fibers of different sizes had different ability, but the number of animals were small. But uh, he shared with me some of his collection of fibers, and I actually have one paper with him. And then the question of fiber synergy. There's some data epidemiologically if you mix 
chrysotile with an amphibole, you get more disease than if you have any one of them as a pure exposure. There are, however, many contrived controversies. In India in particular, and in many countries, they talk about the safety of chrysotile. The best data we have on that was a study done in Canada a number of years ago, where they have very strict rules about uh, the use of asbestos. Uh, now they banned it, but uh, uh, they had it. That was fairly recent with the closure of the mines in, in Quebec uh, and elsewhere. But when they did a study in Canada, they looked at 10 work sites where they were supposedly safely using asbestos, and in nine of them, uh, they weren't uh, meeting all of the regulations. When I go to India, they say, oh, chrysotile is the safe chrysotile. Uh, there is no such thing. There is a safe asbestos. The biopersistence issue is another contrived controversy. Biopersistence, they say, well, uh, chrysotile leaves the lung, so it, it can't be causing disease. What they don't tell you is that, yes, it leaves the lung, but it uh, preferentially moves to the pleura. And in some studies, at least uh, Bignon's work in France, Dotson in America, Suzuki in America, Koyama in Japan, showed that the major fiber found in the pleural tissue of patients with mesothelioma is chrysotile. In some cases, 80% of cases had only chrysotile in the pleural. So the fact that it's not found in the lung, which is uh, the work of an um, industry supported uh, toxicologist in uh, Switzerland, Bernstein, this biopersistence issue has uh, been used to obfuscate issues. So called controlled use, there is no such thing. It goes back to the safety uh, issue that it's not safely used, nor is it the safe uh, asbestos. And in India, I've been told that uh, Indians don't get disease like people in the West uh, because genetically they're different. I've done my undergraduate work before medical school in anthropology, and I can assure you that be it uh, an Italian or a German or an Indian, we share 99.999% of our genes, and so they don't have any more genetic variability than you know, anything else. And so clearly, that is a contrived controversy that has no basis in fact. So Montecumari did the uh, autopsy in 1899, and in 1906 he wrote this. One hears, generally speaking, that considerable trouble is now taken to prevent the inhalation of dust, and so the disease is not so likely to occur as heretofore. Over a hundred years ago, we knew that there was disease caused by asbestos. We knew that it should not uh, have as much exposure. Uh, but here we are in 2022, and this is the spectrum of asbestos disease. There's the family of non-malignant diseases, asbestos warts, which are really of no consequence, benign asbestotic pleural effusions. Clinically, they're quite scary to the clinician. It's a bloody effusion in the chest. You're sure there's a cancer. You look for it. You can't find it. Um, fortunately, it's, it's not all that common, but it is the thing that shows up usually within the first 10 years of exposure. Uh, I've had patients with that, uh, and you just can't find the cancer, even though it's a bloody effusion. But uh, asbestosis, uh, both parenchymal and plural, uh, is definitional definitional issues about that, uh, but it doesn't matter. You get scarring, however you want to call it, or asbestos-related pleural disease. So Selikoff used the term pleural asbestosis, as do I. Uh, what you have also is a whole family of malignant diseases. There are other things that cause multiple kinds of cancer. Arsenic will do it, for example, but what's astonishing about these asbestos fibers it produces lung cancer, mesotheliomas, gastrointestinal tract cancers, laryngeal cancers, oropharyngeal cancers, um, kidney cancer, and ovarian cancer in women. So uh, it is a multipotential carcinogen in so many different organs. It also has the ability to cross the placenta and end up in a, in a baby. We know that from stillbirth studies. Uh, there was a study done in the uh, Texas along the Texas-Mexican border, 
Um, the town of Gisdale with its um, stillbirth of a baby that had never taken a breath of life, couldn't have taken asbestos into the body through breathing, and yet they found asbestos which had crossed the placenta uh, and entered into the uh, baby. Uh, if you've never seen what an asbestos mine looks like, this was the town of Asbestos, Quebec. They've given it a new name, some nice valley sounding name, so it doesn't carry the approbation of uh, asbestos. The Russian uh, mines, you know, look something like this. They're big open pit mines. So there are some underground mines as well in some places. Here's a better looking asbestos body. See more cleanly defined one. And I would venture to say, because it's a ubiquitous material, it's naturally occurring. We don't make asbestos, we mine it, separate it from its parent rock, and then put it over uh, time into some three to 5,000 different products. It's astonishing what asbestos has ended up in it one time or another. Uh, everybody in this room has some asbestos in their lung. Uh, does that mean everybody's going to get an asbestos disease? Of course not. Just like you're exposed to benzene every day, you're exposed to sunlight, you don't all get skin cancer, you don't all get leukemia, uh, but it is a pretty ubiquitous material. This is uh, for the pathologist here what the scarred lung tissue looks like. It should be nice and thin and lacy, but it isn't. Um, this is uh, scarred lung tissue. Um, not the best x-ray, but an x-ray of what asbestosis might uh, look like. It starts in the lower lung zones, usually bilaterally, works its way up. Different from the other dusts, like silica and coal dust, start as rounded opacities instead of irregular opacities. They start at the top and work their way down. This is the lung of a chrysotile miner from Canada. Uh, it was a patient uh, at Mount Sinai some years back. Uh, that rind around the lung is not a mesothelioma, as you might expect. That is simple pleural thickening. It's fibrotic tissue. You see how thick it is, the rind. Uh, he had come in because he had a decortication, a removal of his pleura on one side, was waiting to have the other side uh, decorticated. Uh, this is markedly compressed lung. He was a man of 42 or 43, I don't remember. Um, but he developed, uh, you know, hospitals are terrible places to be as a patient. Uh, he picked up a hospital acquired pneumonia, didn't survive, and that's how we got to do this autopsy. Richard Dahl in Great Britain uh, published the first epidemiology on uh, lung cancer. Those cases have been suggested as early as 1935 by a number of people, including Lynch and Smith in the United States. They looked at an asbestos textile factory and saw more lung cancer than they expected. Uh, Wilhelm Euper in 1942 wrote a book, Occupational Tumors and Allied Diseases. He spoke of, uh, in his opinion, uh, that uh, asbestos was a cause of lung cancer, but Dahl showed that uh, with this one uh, factory in England, 18 cases of lung cancer, 17% of the deaths, um, and he expected 4% should have been due to smoke, I mean, to uh, asbestos, I'm sorry. So uh, this was the first epidemiology. Uh, lung cancer is the same in terms of cell type. What is a little different is the locations tend to change. Most lung cancers traditionally in smokers are in the upper uh, lung zones and centrally located. Asbestos tends to move it to the lower lung zones and out to the periphery, but it varies all over the lung. Sometimes it's hard, like here, are we dealing with the lung cancer or mesothelioma because it's abutting the aura. Um, so it does change the location. It makes it hard to pick up clinically because it grows sometimes in the same area that you have underlying asbestosis and you find it harder to, to, to find a, a lesion buried in the fibrotic lung. For those of you that may have never perhaps seen it, this is a tobacco field. Uh, I spent a lot of years in Kentucky, which was the second leading state in terms of growing tobacco. Uh, why do I show you tobacco? Because it has a special relationship uh, with uh, uh, asbestos. We'll talk about that. This is a typical appearance uh, clinically of a patient with a mesothelioma. 90% of them are in the pleura about 10% in the abdomen. 
they don't get studied nearly as much. 1% uh, will show up uh, roughly in the, the pericardium and a little less than that in the testicular area of nails, uh, all of which have mesothelial tissue. Um, in the chest, you also end up with uh, pleural calcifications. This is what, what they may look like, certainly an autopsy. You pick up some of this on an X-ray or much more easily on a CT scan. Here is massive pleural uh, or, or diaphragmatic uh, calcification. In an individual, you'll see this on edge as a, a thick white line on, on an X-ray. This is clinically what a mesothelioma might look like just encasing the lung. And this is a presentation of a gentleman with a, a peritoneal mesothelioma. He was an active union member of the Insulation Workers Union, uh, had had two episodes of benign aspirostatic pleural effusions, but then uh, succumbed to a peritoneal mesothelioma. We, this was back in the 80s. We took him to the operating room. This is what his tumor looked like uh, throughout his abdomen. Why did I mean, it was inoperable, clearly, but this was early days looking for new chemotherapy agents. When I started in this business in the 60s and early 70s, um, lifespan for an expected mesothelioma patient was on the order of six to 12 months with the newer chemotherapy and immunotherapy. That number has gone up to about 18 months to three years. Very, very few, but some people can live many years under treatment. Uh, but we took tissue to see if we could find a chemotherapy drug that worked. Unfortunately, nothing did. In 1931, uh, Dr. Kelly Rabin at Mount Sinai, who still years later when I was a young student there, was one of my professors reported on a single case of mesothelioma. It was 1931, he went back into the literature and found three other cases. It was a very rare disease. The Harvard autopsy series shows essentially nothing called a mesothelioma before about 1880. Very, very few cases. The Sinai uh, pathology series shows very few cases. And one of the pathologists, Dr. Otani, said he didn't even think there was such a thing pathologically as a mesothelioma. He thought it was a variant of a fibrosarcoma. So Drs. Raven and Otani had this friendly uh, debate for the next 30 years um, looking for new cases. Now, Mount Sinai uh, was a hospital with 100,000 admissions a year. And in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, in three decades, there were three cases of mesothelioma one in each decade. And so roughly, if you had a baseline of disease, it was about one in a million people, maybe. And these are hospitalized people, so probably less than that, but one in a million. So now when you have rates of 10 or 12 or 15 or, or 50 per million, we're talking about something way greater than you know what the tradition had been. Uh, with regard to mesothelioma, even though there had been earlier reported cases of mesotheliomas related to asbestos, 1938 in Germany, a plumber in the United States in 1944, in Wagner's uh, report of 1960, in a four-year period, he had 33 cases of mesothelioma, all from the Northwest Cape province, uh, all seen in four years in an area that had a chrysocyte uh, line. So we now linked very clearly, not epidemiologically. Uh, one of the arguments used by, by defendants in legal cases is you need to have epidemiology and you need to have epidemiology for every different product, which of course is all foolishness, but uh, uh, this was a case series and everybody agreed asbestos caused mesothelioma, vinyl chloride causing angiosarcomas was thought of exactly the same way. It was not an epidemiological study. It was this case series for another very rare disease, both of them being called signal tumors for their respective exposures. Wagner, for his troubles in South Africa, got kicked out, ended up in uh, Great Britain, went to the Lucaniosis Research Institute for Health, um, and he, he did some animal studies. And if you look here at the data, I think you'd be hard pressed to say that Chrysotal was the safe asbestos. It caused as many, if not more, lung cancers compared to the amphiboles, and it caused as many mesotheliomas as chrysotelite. So clearly, this is not 
a safe asbestos. What was also astonishing about his work was how little exposure he took to cause disease. That's a very logical question. How much does it take? Well, some of his animals had literally but one day of exposure. And the controls, no lung cancers, no mesotheliomas uh, at all, ever. Uh, but uh, lung cancers and mesotheliomas showed up with one day of exposure. I am personally aware between the literature and, and personal cases, uh, in one legal case in Australia, of five individuals with one day of known exposure to asbestos ending up with mesotheliomas. Again, it's not perfect. Biology isn't perfect, but there's sort of a dose response relationship we can see here. Over time, more exposure, greater disease. For those of you who don't know the gentleman, this is Dr. Irving Selikoff. Uh, he trained, uh, his medical training was in Great Britain. Uh, he became a pulmonologist. His first famous uh, work was in the late 40s when he helped develop the drug isoniazid, the drug that was the first good drug for the treatment of tuberculosis. For that, he won the Lasker Award, a um, prestigious public health award in the United States. Uh, how did he get involved with asbestos? And Beth has shared with me sort of how he got into the business. Selikoff had set up a pulmonary practice uh, in New Jersey and he started seeing patients uh, from a factory in Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, and these were workers at an Amosite factory making uh, uh, pipe insulation. And he started seeing cases of asbestosis, a disease that was pretty uncommon. He then decided to devote more time to that. And he followed uh, what he called the Willie Sutton rule. Willie Sutton was a bank robber in the United States in the 1930s. And when he was asked, why do you rob banks? He says, well, that's where the money is. So what did Dr. Solikoff do? He found the Asbestos Insulation Workers Union, figuring they had the highest exposure, uh, the longest exposure of workers. Uh, and he linked up with the International Union. Or, uh, indeed, he started studying insulators. And he figured uh, if they don't get disease, uh, then nobody should get disease. And if they do get disease, which they clearly did, that was some of his earliest publications, uh, you could start looking at lesser and lesser levels of exposure. And I will frankly tell you that no matter what group you look at, I have never run across a trade where there's exposure to asbestos that's been looked at or reported about where asbestos disease has not shown up. If you, you know, think of some very odd kinds of exposures, you could never go out, for example, and easily do an epidemiological study of jewelry workers. But jewelers work with you know, expensive metals like gold and platinum. And so when they work on it with, with heat to, to make things, some of it drips and they, they let it drip on an asbestos board. So they can then scrape it back off and make use of it. And I've seen two cases of mesotheliomas in jewelers. You may not know this, but bowling balls you go to a bowling alley. Bowling balls are made out of a plastic that has asbestos binders in them. Um, I saw my first case of a bowling ball, ball driller many years ago. I recently uh, had a lawyer call me up. I do a lot of medical legal work for injured parties in America. And uh, he said, I have an unusual case for you. He said, uh, I bet you've never seen a, a bowling ball driller that's got a mesothelioma. And I said, well, I've seen one before, but I'll take your case on. And interestingly, within three months, I had my third case. And these people had probably had some other exposures too, but at least one of them, that had been their only exposure. So Solikoff was important. Why was he important? He wasn't the first one to tell us about asbestos disease. But in his very famous paper in the JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association in 1964, called Asbestos and Neoplasia, he showed that it was very important to consider the exposure and not the job title. It's been looked at many times since then. You can't look at a job title and figure somebody was exposed. While he studied insulators, he pointed out, as we'll show you, that the whole construction area gets uh, uh, contaminated. So uh, it doesn't matter if you're a plumber or a carpenter or a welder or whatever, 
you're going to have exposure, probably some from your own work or maybe, but certainly from what the insulators are doing around you. This second important paper, and it was actually called one of the most hundred most important papers in JAMA in the 20th century. And that's out of a journal that publishes 50 weeks a year, many articles each edition, a hundred, the hundred most important papers. And one of them was this one where he showed that there was a synergism between smoking uh, and asbestos and the development of lung cancer. And here's that, the early data. There's some discussion uh, now about what the right numbers are, but this was the early data. Uh, if you don't smoke and don't work with asbestos, you have a low rate of getting uh, uh, dying of lung cancer. We'll take that as a ratio of one. If you work with asbestos but don't smoke, your rate of lung cancer is five times. If you're the average one pack a day cigarette smoker but don't work with asbestos, a 10 or 11 fold increase in lung cancer. But if you put the two together, he showed there was a 50 fold increase. Now, others have shown both a synergistic effect. Uh, multiplier effect. Some have said it's additive, some say it's supra additive. I have my own theories about why it was originally found to be um, synergistic like this. I think people who, who later cases no longer look to be multiplicative but more super additive, I think that's probably because of individual susceptibility issues of the likelihood of getting lung cancer, some genetic things. Uh, but clearly, this principle was established. We've seen it with other things, radiation and smoking. We've seen it with benzene and alcohol in terms of uh, hematologic disease. Selikoff, in studying those uh, asbestos workers in Patterson, also showed that even working a month or less with asbestos doubled your risk of getting lung cancer. So that was an important uh, piece of work on lung cancer. Uh, and if you work for two years or more, you had a sevenfold increased risk of getting lung cancer. So uh, clearly, very short exposures carry with it for significant health outcomes. And the other important question that he showed from this, uh, almost 18,000 insulators is uh, the latency issue. You start seeing the first cases generally around 10 years, very unusual. He reports, and I've, I've heard of cases in places like India with massive exposure cases in three, four, five years of mesothelioma. But generally, as you see, it peaks out of 40 and 45 years. Uh, deaths of lung cancer peak at 35 and 40 years. Uh, so the latency is enormous. I've seen cases of mesothelioma from teenagers to nonagenarians, people in their 90s. I think I've even had a centenarian with a mesothelioma. Uh, the mechanism continues to be unclear but we don't need to know the mechanism to know it's harmful. So where are you exposed? Mining and milling, manufacturing, construction, shipbuilding and ship repair, maintenance work, railroads, but also household contact, consumer products, demolition and waste disposal, or that we said. Here's an asbestos insulator putting asbestos cement uh, uh, on uh, a pipe. Uh, he and his union brothers, this was the days before women were active in unions like this. You're not surprised that they end up with uh, a lot of asbestos-related disease. Spraying of asbestos started in Great Britain in 1932. It was brought to America in 35. And by 1970, more than half of all large multi-story buildings were being fireproofed by spray insulation. What are we talking about? Anybody recognize this building? It's one relatively completed, the other on the construction of the Twin Towers in New York. And here's an asbestos insulation worker, you know, there's no mask, he's spraying asbestos on a beam. And as you see, some of it even stayed on the beam. What happened to the rest of it? This is what the insulator would have to come by, and or the laborer would come by and sweep up. This is what the electrician got exposed to. This is what the brick mason was exposed to. So it didn't matter what your trade was, you were exposed in the workplace. This is a picture of the trade center coming down. Uh, wrong place, sorry. Um, but it left lower Manhattan covered with asbestos. Uh, many of us predicted cases of mesothelioma from 9-11 and we're starting to see them. The first cases have shown up. 
This is a, shows bystander exposure. Here we have uh, an asbestos insulator. He's pouring asbestos cement out. But here, this gentleman in the back, he's a bystander. He may be what plumber, carpenter, electrician. He's getting exposed in the workplace. This is clearly not a, an approved asbestos respirator. And the solution to this was not dumping out asbestos from a paper bag, but packaging the asbestos cement in a plastic bag, adding the water, and dumping it out wet. Simple engineering trick that would uh, uh, save exposure. This is what a, a hold of a ship would look like, loaded with asbestos. And uh, uh, Peter Harry's at the Devonport Dockyard showed that the, the, among the sprayers and laggers, the first two trades that were directly handling asbestos, uh, they had a third of the cases of asbestosis that were disabling, and they only had two of 55 cases of mesothelioma. All the other cases were in people who might have worked a little bit with asbestos, but were clearly in the same working environment. A million people in the United States and countless millions around the world do automotive brake jobs for blowing out the asbestos brakes. It's the issue of serious conflict in America. And you notice on his chest here, somebody getting measurements. And this would be from a filter. I can't, I'm not going to tell you that all of these are asbestos fibers, but clearly some of the fibers in there uh, are asbestos. And, and work has been done in many garage settings, automotive repair places, shown very high levels of exposure. So we've talked about occupational exposure. We need to talk a little bit about community exposure and consumer products and general environmental exposure. Here's another x-ray. Uh, you might guess that uh, this looks like the other one I showed you. It's a case of mesothelioma in a 28-year-old gentleman. He presented with pleural discomfort. He was 28. Uh, it took a few months. He finally had a thoracotomy. He was found to have a fused molecular pleural mesothelioma. The lung biopsy showed he had uh, asbestos fibers in his lung. He died just short of his 30th birthday. He had been uh, an accounting major in college and had spent his work career as a bookkeeper. Where would he have gotten his asbestos exposure? But we took a geographic history and we learned that he was born on Ross Street and later lived on Wilson Street in Brooklyn, part of New York City. Here's these two dots are Ross Street and Wilson Street. And here is the Brooklyn Naval Shipyard. So it leaves the shipyard, contaminates the surrounding neighborhood, he got what we would call community exposure, environmental exposure. And we see this all over the world. Uh, Wagner showed it in South Africa. Molly Newhouse showed it in the uh, east, east end of London. The, the considerable proportion of the asbestos meso the mesotheliomas were people who lived within half a mile of an asbestos factory. We've seen it in Japan. We've seen it with an asbestos cement plant in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, it's all over the world. The asbestos doesn't stop at the factory gates. It moves out uh, into the general environment. Uh, this is Molly Newhouse's uh, data. Uh, 76 cases. Uh, about half had industrial exposure. Nine were in uh, relatives. We call that familial exposure. We see wives and children of asbestos exposed workers with disease. Uh, Eleven lived within half a mile of the factory. Where it says, you know, no known exposure. Nobody was asking in 1910 or 1920 about asbestos, so don't take that as no known exposure. It's not known to us. And she wrote this uh, you know, decades and decades later, and nobody was doing proper history tape. In Finland, before they closed their mines, County A had an asbestos mine, County B did not. 6,300 x rays, roughly 500 people with plural calcifications living in the same county. 7,100 people in County B, not a single plural calcification. So environmental exposure is important. Many products had it. This is a can that I used to have. I gave to somebody who has a, a sort of a collection of old asbestos products. Leak-proof asbestos liquid roof coating. Uh, so it would show up in, in products like this. It would show up in uh, uh, materials. This is a, a coat that you could buy. It's a little hard to read. 72% processed wool, 20% nylon, 8% asbestos. Uh, the reason that was imported into the United States was it was cheaper to import a wool blend than pure wool. Somebody saved money. We do have our 
laboratory technician and proper respirator. Uh, and again, I will tell you that some of these are wool fibers, but there's also asbestos fibers in there. And the workers cutting the cloth to make the clothing would have had quite high levels of exposure. The waste materials from some asbestos ended up going to school children as uh, packing in the shade kinds of materials on the asbestos head. We stopped having that done. Christmas decorations, fireproof asbestos to throw on your Christmas tree. Um, and this was probably the most bizarre of all uses that I've come across. A particular brand of cigarettes that for four years had an asbestos filter. Imagine getting a puff of your carcinogen with every puff of your carcinogen. Uh, it had crystallite filters on it. And as a physician, I've certainly prescribed drugs for my patients over the years. And drugs used to be filtered through asbestos filters. And so there would be small amounts of asbestos in those vials of Valium or penicillin or whatever that I'd be injecting into my patients intravenously, intramuscularly, whatever, um, till that was stopped. This is a picture in the background is the Mount Sinai Hospital where I trained. They were knocking down an old apartment building across the street to build a new research building. In those days, they didn't bother to take the asbestos out. They would just knock the building down. Uh, this is what the air in New York would look like. This was the hospital itself. That's uh, asbestos here falling off the pipes. They finally decided this was time to replace the asbestos pipe covering. I would pass here every day. I had my office in one building and Solikoff had his office in another, and I would go by this every day. And they ripped out all the asbestos. They threw it on the back of the truck, not covered. It would drive down to the end of the block. That's Central Park in New York for anybody that's ever been there. It's a big public space. The street uh, at the end of this block is Fifth Avenue, one of our premier boulevards. Uh, the truck would turn left and be driving down in the middle of New York with asbestos blowing out the back of the truck. Now, the truck wasn't very big, so they couldn't store all of the asbestos when they took it out. So they piled it up, and it was under the main air intake for the hospital. The irony of us working at a place like Mount Sinai studying asbestos disease and um, the engineers and the maintenance people not knowing that they're sucking asbestos into the whole complex struck us as rather odd. I moved on to another university. We had our problems with asbestos there. Uh, bicycles would be coming up with asbestos. Here's an ironing board cover that undoubtedly had some asbestos fibers in it as well. But now when asbestos was removed, the workers had to be properly protected, have proper respirators. They would use HEPA filters, they bag the asbestos. Uh, water would be used to keep the dust down. Uh, you'd filter the water so that you weren't adding asbestos laden water to the drinking water of somebody downstream. You would take the fibers back out. You would do air measurements to see that you properly had removed it and hadn't uh, contaminated the area where you were doing removal. And my work has taken me around the world. I've worked in, in Eastern Asia, in China, Mongolia, I worked in Southeast Asia, India, Sri Lanka, uh, worked in South America. So we're in a one world marketplace now, global. We have to produce to the same high standards right around the globe. What about safety and health standards? Ah, that depends on which part of the world you work in. So here's two factory workers in China making asbestos breaks. Uh, they're taking these very slick brakes and they're, they're grinding them a bit to make the surface work properly as a brake. They're wearing cotton gauze masks, not going to protect them. This was the textile part of the factory. Asbestos lying around, making asbestos yarn, again, cotton gauze masks. By 1930, there was significant prevention literature. Merriweather and Price talked about the hazards of asbestos. They talked about uh, you had to use proper industrial hygiene technique, you had to use safer materials, you had to um, uh, put in good ventilation. If you had to, you put uh, uh, workers in respirators. And of course, it was important by 1913, as they wrote, to give workers the sane appreciation of the risk. How often is it the workers are not educated about the hazards of the materials they're working with. We knew that in 1930. So why are we still dealing with the issue of asbestos in the 21st century? It's called the asbestos lobby or 
whatever else you want to call it. This was all started as a public relations campaign. The first public relations campaign against the hazardous material was the world of tobacco. The tobacco industry went to a public relations company in Washington, Hill and Milton, and they said, look, you can't argue the science. The science clearly shows that tobacco causes disease. But what you can do is not argue the science, but you can create doubt. And that's led to David Michaels producing two books on the subject, Doubt is Your Product, for example. Um, that if you can create doubt about the hazard, you can continue to sell it. We've seen that with the lead industry. We've seen that currently with glyphosate. We see that with other things as well. So the whole issue is to create doubt. And so that brings us to the creation of dishonest science and what I call bought journals. Uh, all journals are not the same. First of all, in the last 10, maybe 15 years, we've had a proliferation, a plethora of new journals that are simply there to make money. We get solicited all the time. Please send an article, whatever. All they're there to do is to publish uh, and make for the publishers money. Page charges are high and so forth. But there are some journals that have been around a long time, but they've been co-opted by, by people in uh, industry. Even one of the journals that, that I was involved with, I was on the editorial board of the journal run by David Eagleman, the International Journal of the Occupational Environmental Health. It was a leading journal of honest science from all over the world. Um, he sold out to a small publishing company that stayed on as editor-in-chief. They were bought out by one of the big publishing houses that, that publishes a number of these so-called, what I call them, bought journals. Um, I was on the editorial board with 21 other people, and we get told by the publisher, we're putting a new editor-in-chief in. No discussion about why Eagleman couldn't serve. No discussion with the editorial board as to who the new editor should be. If you read the uh, guidelines for how journals should work, publishers should not be choosing editorial uh, uh, positions, uh, editors in chief, it should be the editorial board. Uh, we wrote to them, we said, we don't like the person you picked. It was a well-known industry related person. We knew that it would transmogrify the journal into another one of these industry oriented journals. Um, and uh, they gave the editorial board short shrift. I led the 21 other scientists, all 22 of us signed a letter en masse resigning of the, from the editorial board of that journal, decrying how they had taken care of it, you know, taken care of us, and, and speaking, or, you know, we didn't think this was a proper new editor in chief. Ironically, I was proven absolutely correct that we were. Uh, within a few weeks, I was sent an article to review, uh, even though I was no longer technically on the board. Uh, and it was from uh, classic industry bought scientists. And if, if he was now going to be submitting to this journal, we knew exactly what this journal was going to become. It all of a sudden, within uh, six months, folded, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, Eagleman tried to buy it back. They wouldn't sell it back to him. Uh, so he started another, another journal. Uh, so th this is a very real issue that you have to be aware of. So we talked about legitimate areas. Decades, Canada was a, a bad actor. Uh, now we deal with Russia and its minions, uh, Kazakhstan, um, and so forth, India. Uh, and of course, what the problem is in Barry, would speak much more eloquently about this when the Rotterdam Convention, which is run through the United Nations, wants to put a special notice of uh, potential ill health on a product. All 162 nations have to agree, four or five hold out. You know, so it never has joined up on the, the Rotterdam Convention. You know, I mean, four, four or five or six countries uh, led by Russia uh, haven't agreed to it. Um, so asbestos uh, has never gotten that designation. There are some very real world issues. There's a case I was involved with in BASF, uh, that big multinational company. They uh, were in the talc business. 
Um, they were using contaminated talc. They managed to fudge that. They, when when there was data in their own laboratories of contaminated talc, they literally collected the lab notebooks and had them destroyed back in the 1980s. This only came to light because uh, a man who had worked for them, his daughter got a mesothelioma from handling the company's product, and she had a lawsuit, and he went and testified on his own child's behalf and was involved in that lawsuit. So all of this came out. The Johnson & Johnson talc story. Now, first of all, I should just mention that talc is probably a major source of exposure that people don't recognize and don't appreciate. Um, in places like India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, hundreds of millions of people use talcum powders on a daily basis because of the heat and, and whatever. Um, and uh, many, many plus talc deposits are contaminated with asbestos. So I suspect there are many cases of mesothelium. In fact, I know there are because we've just submitted a paper with some colleagues 175 cases of mesothelioma. Everybody was exposed to talc. We went over all of their histories, and only about 42 or 43 people had other potential exposures to asbestos. So most of these mesotheliomas, mostly in women, uh, were all just talc related. Chloralkali industry in America wants to continue to use asbestos filters. They're fighting the regulation of asbestos. They have alternative uh, sources that are a little bit more expensive, uh, but would pay off in a few years. And then in India, we have uh, the real world issue. Of a lot of the asbestos cement plants are owned by members of parliament, so they don't want to put their own businesses out of business. It comes down to a real moral failure and very simply, in my view, to greed. Barry shared with me that what we're dealing with here is not just uh, a moral failure, but criminal behavior. And so, uh, and it just has a beautiful new paper on this that he's published. Uh, but uh, papers that literally have been called out in court as bordering on scientific fraud. Uh, there are many instances of not carrying out proper scientific studies, like in India, where the industry paid for, conducted, uh, designed and conducted a study of the asbestos industry rather than the government agency, the one that didn't collect the mesothelioma cases. Uh, and uh, um, uh, the industry came out with a whitewash that there was no problem with asbestos. I critique that as did others when the death of them. It was a terrible piece of work. Uh, only telling selected workers about disease. And the reason you have a, a trial here right now in Italy, again, uh, for Ethernet is, is workers were never educated. The Ford Motor Company would tell their own workers about the hazards of asbestos and dealing with brakes, but they wouldn't tell the workers at the dealerships who were not their direct employees. The dealerships had people exposed to asbestos. The criminal trials in Italy and you know, the The issue of paying for punitive damages in some courts when you found guilty not of criminal behavior, but civil behavior, but they're added and punitive damages. Um, there's tens of millions of dollars that have been paid to scientists for dishonest science. And then the selective selling of products. Johnson & Johnson claimed it's going to go into that, or claim bankruptcy over its talc work. They stopped selling it in North America, but then they continued to sell it in 160 countries around the world. I wrote a letter to the editor of a local newspaper in Philadelphia and said, fine, they've stopped using, selling it in America, but it's okay to keep killing people around the world. That got, unbeknownst to me, some nasty response from a gentleman who I looked up, found that he was a Johnson & Johnson vice president. Um, they finally stopped selling it around the world. So, Brings me down this one. I should call it slide. Not the uh, sort of there anyway. Yeah. Um, basically, what I want to share with you that, that when it comes to asbestos disease, as well as all of the pneumoconioses. They are still, if you will, best treated by prevention. None of these diseases can be cured once you have them be asbestos or silica or coal dust or mica or anything else. 
And we really want to treat the disease by preventing it. And the way to prevent it is stop using the product. So with that, thank you very much. And thank you.